<clears throat> first, the, what I want to cover and mostly talk about is uh, WFLN AM. Um, this was my first job out of college. I um, graduated from Temple, had an engineering degree in hand and a first class FCC license in hand and applied to WCAU because I was a brand new facility and I wanted to work there and then I was rejected except that there was a, an office boy position open that didn't quite qualify for me. The second place I wanted was WFLN because I love classical music and was a listener of the station. And I was hired by the chief engineer. First day on the job, I arrived, he handed me a pick and a shovel. <laughs> and he said, I need you to dig a trench around the transmitter building. And so, FCC license, first class, college degree, I'm digging a trench. But the trench was for a ground strap, three inch wide copper strap, which we then silver soldered ground wires, one every degree, for a quarter wavelength all the way around the tower. At the time I started at the station, um, the first two towers were up. They were RCA towers, and the consulting engineer had oodles and oodles of problems, couldn't get the rig to work. Uh, they tried every current, every phase that he could come up with. The slide wool was working overtime and uh, couldn't get it. So he assumed, or thought that the problem was there was too much reflection from the towers that are along the railroad line. And so <clears throat> we got permission to get onto those towers and put a wire from the top to the bottom with a tuning box at the bottom so we take a field strength meter and go to each one of those towers and nullify its reflection. And thought, well, that was what was causing the problem. That's what we were going to do to make it work. Went back to the field. He went through all of his tuning processes again. No luck. It wouldn't work. Went back. Our consulting engineer was out of Delaware. He went back to Delaware talked to other consulting engineers and couldn't come up with any answer. And in the meantime, management is very frustrated. They got this building and the transmitter and two towers and the ground and can't get on the air because we can't meet the back end of the lobe for two spots in New Jersey. So he came up with the idea that two tower system should really work. No problem. But a three tower system is overkill. And he says, we have to go to a three tower system. And that's the time I joined the company with the third tower. That was a stainless tower. It was put up, put the ground system in. I made changes to the phase cabinet to add another uh, coils for uh, level and uh, phase. And um, when that was done, the consulting engineer came back. And there was three of us with field strength meters in the field by uh, telephone boxes and he would call us and tell us to go out and measure a couple of the spots and call them back with the results. Well we did this for several days. He went through every phase, every current level, every possibility in tuning and couldn't get it. It didn't work. Well this only added frustration to not only the engineering side for him but for management, now they've spent the money on another tower and it's still not getting approved and it still won't work. So he went back to uh, Delaware, talked to some more engineers, and decided to go back to a two tower system, but this time using tower number two and tower number three. So we disconnected tower one and made it floating, and then went back in the field and going through the calisthenics of trying to get it to work again. And lo and behold, it worked. We got the signal down enough for the stations that we had to protect. And that, that put us on the air. Uh, this is the, uh, the tower monitoring system. 
barely see my laser there, and a modulation monitor. Uh, this is part of the, the racks of the transmitter building. That's the uh, three towers. You can barely see the tower number one. But uh, the Chevy, 54 Chevy in front of the building is mine, and that was not built for living in. It was going to be remote controlled, so there was no reason to have any human facilities in it. But the FCC was not going to accept that you could go to remote control without three years of it being manned and monitored. So for that period of time, we started to live there from sunrise to sunset in the building. And as a result, we had a hot plate and we cooked our meals. Uh, we had a cot to take naps and sleep on. We put wall heaters in to get a little heat during the winter time. That's the RCA one kilowatt transmitter with four 833 final tubes. Great transmitter, worked very well. And uh, the cabinet next to it is the, is the phasing cabinet which was modified a number of times during the uh, tower construction. I'm pretty sure that transmitter ended up at WGSA in Africa. You think so? Yeah, it's the transmitter that I saw. Yeah. In the center of the room, I don't think it's still there, was a little mixer, homemade, uh, tape machine, and here we could, you know, the signal was coming from the FM by telephone line, and also we could take it off the air from a tuner, and we also had the capability of broadcasting anything locally there from tape. Yeah, that, that stuff, most of that stuff was gone by yeah. five. Yeah, there's no reason to have any of that there now. And a workbench, which a lot of the projects from the FM station were brought down here for repair since we were doing nothing but babysitting a transmitter. I was um, full-time and... Uh, in charge of the AM facility. I had three other part-time engineers that worked with me. So we covered from sunrise to sunset seven days a week. What year was that? I think 1959. Uh, that's the four final tubes in the transmitter. And the young kid that got the job. I was... Um, I think 23 at the time, 22 or 23, because I was just out of college. That's the transmitter building again, which is still in existence. Now, car dealership. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, as some of you may or may not know, that this whole area was all swampland originally, and the Philadelphia a trash department had worked many years of dumping trash over these swamp areas all along Passyunk Avenue all the way to the airport which was swampland. So at this point the um, mound of dirt and trash that's underneath that goes about 20 feet deep. And uh, it was compact enough to, to put a building on it and when they were doing the trash sites they would put some clean fill in between trash levels so that there was trash and dirt, trash and dirt, that was bulldozed and compacted by the bulldozers. But then a, alongside of it came an automobile junkyard that ended up ripping up a lot of our ground system as they dragged cars across it. Uh, but surprisingly enough, we were still able to maintain the signal. That's looking at what the land was like at that time. You can see in the distance there, that was not one of the towers, the power towers that we tuned. They were further over here on the side along the railroad. <laughs> now going to the FM site, um, what had happened is as the chief of the AM station, uh, I was working there just fine, but the chief engineer of the station was running another business. And he wasn't available all the time and he wasn't doing the job. There were lots of problems at the station which he wasn't attending to. So management decided to fire him. I thought, well, if he's fired, I'm going to apply for the job. 
So I went up and interviewed with Ray Green, who was the vice president, general manager. And uh, he says, do you think he can do the job? And I said, sure, no problem. I said, I've got the education, the background, the degree. And he says, how would you feel, though, being as young as you are, having people older than you working for you? And I said, I don't think that would be a problem. So he gave me the job. And just at that time, just prior to my getting the job, we started to construct, this is a Collins single channel console. And we were the second station in the market to go stereo. WFIL was first. And um, at that time, there was no facilities for doing stereo and broadcast, other than we had an ITA a stereo exciter that put out 10 watts to drive the transmitter. So the way that we got stereo is that we had back in the corner here two consumer grade turntables with stereo cartridges because broadcast turntables were not available at that time. These Neumann tables, the rumble was too high to put a stereo cartridge on it. So what we did is we took the output of preamps from those two turntables and fed them into the input stage of this Ampex 351-2. And then to, to get it on the air, over here, there were boxes that we made up with uh, knife switches in them. And pushing the knife switch would lift the console off of the exciter and then pick up the two channels from the tape machine feeding the stereo exciter. So you'd switch from the console to the tape machine, then another switch would turn the power on to one of the motors of that turntable. You needed three-quarter, maybe an all uh, full revolution to be up to speed before the first note. But being a classical music station, it wasn't necessary to be that tight. And the operators got pretty good at it. But as they were announcing, they'd start the turntable and knowing that they had that revolution and then switch to the tape machine to put it on the air. So that's how we got stereo on the air. We didn't transfer the records to tape. Oh, we had tapes that were uh, quarter inch. We had, playback machine, so we had the playback machine, but to transfer the records was too big of a production job to do that. Then you'd have to leader it. And then. You'd have to be constantly changing reels. It was a nuisance to, to run tape as opposed to records. And records were coming out now a little more frequently. But the only thing we had to put on in stereo was just music. All the announcements and everything else were all mono. And to do that, you'd come back to the console, pick up uh, the news, or um, and do a, an announcement or anything else. The commercials were all in mono, and feeding the, trans, the uh, transmitter in mono. And then the FCC came along and said they had a ruling that you couldn't have the subcarrier on when you're broadcasting in mono. So uh, you could do it for short periods of time, but not for long. So when we were using one of the regular turntables here with a mono recording, that was not acceptable. So along in this box over here, I put another switch in that would turn the stereo generator on and off. <laughs> so the operator, when he went to mono, had to turn the stereo generator off, and then going to stereo, had to put the stereo generator on, switch to the Ampex machine, and then start the motor on the turntable. Busy board <laughs> and needless to say, there were times that not all the steps were followed perfectly. <laughs> But that was a Rube Goldberg way of, of running the station. And uh, when I did take over, there were lots of uh, grounding problems and uh, other. The previous chief engineer, when something needed to be wired, he made the, the solder attachments to the patch bay, run the cable across the floor to the piece of equipment, and just plug it into the piece of equipment. So as a result, in the transmitter room, there were audio wires on the, laying on the floor all over. So one by one, on midnight maintenance, I'd find out what the wire was for, disconnect it, and run it properly or not run it at all. And little by little, I got the problems out. 
and both of the control rooms were never grounded. So we ended up going underneath the station in about a 18 inch crawl space and pulling in ground straps so as to ground the, the consoles to the transmitter racks. It was one of the cures of one of the many problems that I had. That one you've seen. This is the what was the control room that over in the side here, that was a recording studio, a big, pretty good sized room, about 50% larger than this room where uh, there was a grand piano in there and would do quartets and live music. And through this console, that's a two-channel console, but it's mono. And the tape machines, uh, the left-hand one is a full-track mono, and the right-hand one is a 354 stereo. I built the racks, put those in, so we had something to record to from that console. This is what it was before I put those other racks in with the, the mono machine. And two, two turntables. So we kind of could operate from there, but no microphone, because right behind this was the transmitter. So this is really a transmitter room, and it was too noisy to use a microphone. Now that's it for WFLN. Yes, the FM was an ITA. I can tell you a great story about that. <laughs> now, while I was there at WFLN, I got all the problems out and things were running pretty smoothly. In that interim period also, they purchased WFMZ in Allentown. And I was told that that would be my responsibility also. So I had the AM, the FM here in the studios, and WFMZ uh, in Allentown. And went up to Allentown with my assistant, and we did a lot of remodeling and repair, and went through the whole bag of beans again to get that station in, in good operation. And it was being run as a classical music station, and what they did is they broadcast one day delayed so that every day somebody would drive up there with a box of records and scripts and commercials to broadcast the following day, which was the same on WFLN-FM. And um, after a number of months, it didn't work very well, and they ended up uh, wanting to sell the station because they weren't able to operate it and operated profitably. And it was costing too much with the commute and trying to double up. So um, at that time, I was involved with a group of five guys that were we were looking to buy a station that we would own ourselves. And uh, depending on the money that we would put up, it would be the percentage of our ownership. And I was able to put up 10%. But the guy who was the leader of this group to purchase the station, he insisted that he had controlling interest of 51%. So I dropped out, but I introduced him to Ray Green and uh, Sam Smith, who were the owners of, of the station, and he ended up buying it, my friend, and uh, is still currently, he's retired like me, but still the current owner of WFMZ, and he converted it to TV as well, which is a very thriving TV station now. And in that process, since I was out of that group, I was one day sitting at my desk and uh, reading Broadcast Engineering Magazine. And it's a bad thing not to have, to have time on your hands with no projects. And there was an ad in there for a chief engineer of WTFM in New York. And just in one of the previous issues of broadcast engineering, this was a station that was built from the ground up for stereo. No fancy knife switch and relays and you know the console, everything was, cart machines, everything was stereo. And I thought, boy, I'd like to see that facility and because I'm gonna have to convert the FM station to something more proper for stereo. So I called the 
number that was in the ad. And the vice president, uh, general manager, said, I'd like to see you in my office. So I uh, said, well, I just worked some midnight hours, and I, I need some sleep. He says, all right. He says, you go home and get two or three hours of sleep, and I'll see you at 3 o'clock this afternoon in my office. A very demanding guy. So I went home, slept a little bit, got in the car, driving to New York. What am I going here? I just wanted to see the station. I just couldn't tell him that I wanted to see what, how it was put together and the equipment used, etc. So I could steal the ideas for back home. And um, at that time, since I picked up WFMZ in Allentown, I went to management and said, look, you're giving me additional responsibility of another station. I would like to have a raise. And I researched a little bit as to what the going rate was for chief engineers in the Philadelphia market. And I asked for a little bit more than the highest chief engineer in the Philadelphia market. And to my surprise, he gave me the raise. So I was the high at that moment anyway, you know, you don't know who will follow me to, to jump leap across me, but that moment I was the highest paid chief engineer in Philadelphia. So I'm driving to New York and I thought, how am I going to get out of this? <coughs> you know, I want to see the station. I said, ah, I know. He's going to, if he comes to the point, we're going to discuss money. And that will be where we'll part ways. Because he just wouldn't be able to meet my demands and I would come home feeling I accomplished my purpose and, uh, and put him off. So he interviewed me for, I did the tour and he interviewed me for about two hours. Very thorough over my background and qualifications and what I'd done. Great discussion. And at the end of this he looked me square in the eye and said, you're the man I want. And I said, okay. And he says, what we haven't talked about is salary. I thought, here's where we're going to part ways. So he says, what do you want? So I took my Philadelphia newly engaged salary, and I doubled it. <laughs> and I just doubled it and I said, this is what I want. He looked at me with the coldest stare for what I think was an eternity. And he said, all right, oh, now what am I going to do? He <laughs> said, I had a comfortable position back in Philadelphia. I was living at home. I didn't have these extra expenses, etc." And he said, all right. He said, shall we set a date for your start? And he looked at his calendar, and I said, well, I have to give them notice at WFLN. He said, all right, two weeks from today you will start. Not, do you want to? He says, you will start. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up having to go back again to find an apartment, looked at a lot of apartments and places, and ended up in Bayside, about 10 minutes away from the station, where I looked at an efficiency apartment that the woman who was living there died. And the landlord said that we need to upgrade the appliances and we want to paint it and do everything new. And he said, that would take several weeks, and I said, I need it in, in two weeks. And he said, all right, if you want it in two weeks and you take it the way it is, he says, I'll let you have it according to the um, laws in New York of the rental uh, laws. We have to offer it to you at the same price that the lady was paying because we didn't, won't modify it. So I said, okay, I said, I can move the stuff out and put new carpeting in, do some painting and fix it up for myself. And he said, all right, the rate uh, that you need to be paying, which includes your electric and heat, will be $86 a month. Because it was under rent control, New York City rent control for 30 years. So I got a fantastic place and did the conversions the weekend before I was to start, at least enough to make it livable, and then started uh, at WTFM. At that time, I didn't realize it, but I ran into another bag of worms. There were so many problems with the station of things not working. The coverage was poor, a lot of dead spots. Antenna was only 350 feet, 
but still operating at uh, 20,000 watts uh, with, a, with a gain into the antenna to make it 50. Um, Where was so the antenna at that point? This was in Fresh Meadows, right alongside the Long Island Expressway. Um, and Lake Success was the city of license, which you had to put a primary coverage over your city of license, but that was further out on the island, but it did meet that qualification. And WPAT in New York was also doing uh, easy music as well, and they were doing a little bit better because they were in Manhattan and had a better transmitter site than what we had, because we were just in lots of nulls and dead spots hiding, so it, as it were, in amongst the buildings. So um, while this is happening, um, I got the place debugged again, started to live a normal, easy life. When Dave Pollinger called me up into the office and he says, I'll tell you one of the reasons that we hired you. He says, we've signed a contract with the New York World's Fair that we're going to broadcast from there and we're going to have recording studios there. There was a recording studio at WTFM also. That was my first recording studio. So, and it would be your responsibility to set it up. So, and he gave me the name of the architect for the uh, Better Living Center. And he says, you've got to work out the space that you need and where you're going to be and what you're going to do. So I started that process. And a number of months later, I had a control room built where people could look in. An announcer could actually come out and shake hands with the people. And uh, then next to it, a recording studio where you could do karaoke stuff and voiceovers and anything the public wanted to do. But it looked down onto a stage in the Better Living Center where there were all kinds of performances going on. And we could record those and offer it to the people or whatever at that point. So when that was all set up and running, it, my work week was about 80 hours a week. So I got double pay, but I got double hours. So when that, that lasted for two years, the end of that, I had to tear it all down, uh, bring back all the equipment, tables, chairs, anything that we wanted to keep, and then the bulldozer did the rest of the building and tearing the whole building down. <coughs> I thought, all right, now I've got extra cart machines and extra consoles and extra microphones. You know, this makes life a little easier for backups and replacements. And so I thought life was easy again. And uh, lo and behold, he calls me up one morning up to his office again, and everybody in the place dreaded when Dave Pollinger was going to call you up to his office. He was going to ream you out for something or present something or check something on you that was just not pleasant. So I went up to his office, sat along the other side of his desk, and he said, the board of directors and the chairman of the board, this was Friendly Frost, who owned 33 appliance stores. The broadcast division had two stations, which was part of their ownership, because the chairman of the board liked radio, and he liked, that was his toy. And he said, uh, we need to upgrade our transmitter site and we got to compete with WPAT and it says the board has deemed it that we want you to make this a New York City radio station. And he says that's, that's your assignment, that's what you will do. Not can you, you will do it. And so I said alright. So I proceeded with that. I went to first, so well the place to go would be the Empire State Building. And I met with Alfred Engineering, uh, Antenna Engineering from Boston. And they have on the Empire State Building antennas that go around just above the observation tower, which is a common antenna for all the FM stations in New York. So all you'd need to do would be to couple into it, feed your transmitter into it, and pay a rental fee for being on the antenna and being in the Empire State Building. Uh, and there was space available for a transmitter site uh, for rent from the Empire State Building. However, the consulting engineer uh, from Washington said that if you're moving in there and you're going at that height, uh, you'll need to reduce your power 
to somewhere around 20,000 watts ERP and not 50, and maybe less on, based on the, so as to protect two stations in New Jersey. So I thought that wasn't very good. So I proceeded the search for, um, I guess I have to touch the pad to get that up again, don't I? So I continued the search in New York and decided that the next biggest building was the Chrysler Building, which you see a picture of here. So I went there with property management and told them what I wanted to do was to put a transmitter in their building, rent space, and put an antenna at the top. And they said, all right, uh, we're agreeable to that. So I said, well, I first need to research the, uh, the building and to see if it was feasible. So what I did is that uh, I climbed up there. When the elevator goes up to the 60, I think it's the 63rd floor, and you walk around the corridor, there's a small elevator that goes up to 73, then from 73 up, it steps to the next level, and then the next level after that is you start climbing ladders. So I climbed on ladders to see what was up there, and I climbed up all the way to the bottom of the finial. And at that point, I couldn't go any further because physically I couldn't do it because you were climbing on ang um, one and a quarter inch angle irons that were three feet apart. <coughs> and I couldn't hoist myself with my arms and go up any further. But I could look all the way to the top and see that it was open. So I came down and said, yeah, this site's going to work. And uh, with the idea of taking space on the 74th floor for the transmitter site, and it was a big open floor, I said, I only need a couple of hundred square feet for a transmitter. I said, I want to chain link fence it off and just take a couple of hundred square feet and then the rights to put an antenna up on the finial. And they agreed to that. And with our lawyers and the general manager, and we came back to the rental office and signed a 100-year lease for the use of the finial and for the transmitter space. So I thought, oh boy, now I'm in. I've got to make this work because the lease is signed, a deposit was made, and the rent starts immediately. So um, in the meantime, I went back to Alfred Engineering that built the antennas on the Empire State Building and said, I'm going to need help with this. And they said, well, I think we can do it. We can build an antenna that will work on the Chrysler Building. So what had happened is that this guy here, John French, and I, two young kids, had this monumental project. I was, at that time, I think, 26 or 27, and he was the same age as me. And the two of us were tackling this monumental project in New York City. A couple of kids did, really didn't know what they were doing, I guess. But at any rate, what he did is he got the engineering prints from the office uh, of the finial, went back to Boston, and built the finial one-seventh the size, because he didn't know whether it could be done. And he built the antennas one-seventh the size, and played around with them, and did the field testing on these antennas, because we had two stations to protect in New Jersey. So it had to be a cardioid pattern that focused up on towards New England and out on the island and not towards New Jersey. Well, he did his work on this while I was doing the research for the electric and for the transmitter and for the all of how to get the signal to the Chrysler building, etc. And um, with this design, he went with our consulting engineer to Washington to the FCC and they looked at it and said, well, if these are your measurements, and if that's the way it works, we would accept it, but we'd need proof of that. So we went back to Boston and rebuilt the finial actual size, full scale. Redid the antennas full scale and mounted them on a turntable, put them out in the field, and um, uh, rotated the antenna with the measurement staying fixed and came up with the pattern. 
And that's what he designed that went on top of the Chrysler building, this, this pattern. Now, the Chrysler building is set on square streets in New York and the protection needed to be skewed to one side. So what he ended up do, doing is he made the brackets pivot, or not pivot, but move to the area that he wanted so he could rotate the antenna a little bit on top of the square finial to get those nulls in the area that he wanted them to be. And uh, went back to Washington, to the FCC. They looked at it and saw his test results and said, we approve this, we'll give you a construction permit. So with that, we got the construction permit and started. That's the full-scale antennas uh, up in, in Boston. And it's hard to see, but it is on a table that turns. And these are the vertical antennas. And you can see they're opposite sides so as to be like AM antennas where you get a forward gain and a backward loss. And then the horizontal antenna, uh, in another picture later you'll see he put some reflectors on it because the horizontal would have been 360 degrees equal and needed to get the signal to go uh, north and east. But from that design, that setup, the FCC approved it. The next thing was the, then we had to get it mounted onto the Chrysler building. <coughs> this is a picture of the finial from um, <coughs> down below. The finial was constructed of angle iron uh, for the support and the surface of it was all stainless steel. I think about one eighth inch stainless steel. <coughs> So pretty easy to work with, but the structure was pretty good inside, pretty firm to withstand high winds, etc. Uh, that's just a view of New York and the Empire State Building from the Chrysler Building. Uh, the Pan Am Building was right near, as you know, is right near the Chrysler Building, and the Chrysler Building exceeds the height of the Pan Am Building. The Empire State Building again. <coughs> Here we go. Uh, there's another shot of the Pan Am building from the Chrysler building. While working there, an interesting story. They had commuter planes, planes from the Pan Am building to Kennedy Airport. So you come to the Pan Am, take the elevator up, and take a helicopter to the airport, as opposed to taking a taxi. And that was in operation for a while, and it was discontinued because of the updraft winds on either side of the building were making it difficult for the helicopter pilots to land. And I was watching one day as a helicopter was coming in. He started to come down, and the updrafts would push him to one side or the other. And the helicopter's going back and forth, back and forth. And so when you're looking out the window, one minute you see the deck, and the next you're seeing down on 42nd Street. Or that would be 40th, I think. And then you'd you know, see the street and the other side. And he was doing this back and forth, and he got to a point, he just let it go when he was right over the roof and plopped down on it. And I saw passengers coming out. One guy came out. He fell to his hands and knees and kissed the deck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But because of that, they discontinued using the Pan Am building for transportation. That's just a side story of something that was interesting to watch. Come on, change. You're not going to do when you go back, or you won't go forward. Well, if that won't happen that way, we'll do it. Now. It's not going to do it from here either. There we go. That's um, the UN building in New York. View of Manhattan up, up towards Central Park. What were these, these were taken with a Minox camera, by the way, an 8 millimeter film. What were these pictures taken? These were taken, um, the World's Fair was 60, 1964 and 65. So this would have to be 66. But 
but Warren, I wanted to ask about that. Dual polarization didn't come into about 67 or 68. No, we did it first. So that's what I was wondering. So yeah. we, were, we, were we built the first directional FM antenna that's ever. Second question. Yes. Okay. These young kids managed to pull it off uh, in a design that was never even attempted before. All FMs up to that point were non directional. Okay. And height was the most important thing. And height was the most important thing to us, too, even though we were directional, because that would penetrate further out the island and up towards uh, New England. Was the antenna on the Empire State Building, the Alfred antenna, was yes. circular? Um, that was uh, dual polarization. Their antennas were at a 45 degree angle. So you feel about a phase? Uh, I don't know how they fed them because these poles were all the way around the building, which fed one master um, pipeline, which you could tap into and feed your signal into. Yeah, what you get is if you put a dipole at 45 degrees, you get half the power is, is in... Vertical and half as horizontal, yes. So it's a, That's the way they accomplished it uh, in New York. Yeah, yeah. One of the things in my search for a transmitter site is I looked at something like this, and you can see these towers built on top of the of a building, but right next to it, a tower or a building that creates a nice shadow. And this is what we didn't want to do, was to go through the construction of a tower on top of, of an office building somewhere and still not get that primary coverage and still have to protect New Jersey and I remembered from WFL and AM things create reflections and I didn't want a building creating reflection. So that was one of the things that led me also to, to uh, research the Chrysler building because it was high enough that it wasn't going to get reflections from other buildings. This is now looking down um, from the 70 what we think be the 71st floor. These here are Channel 2's TV antennas. We're not up to the finial yet. It's still fairly wide at this point. But that's looking down to the street from, from this higher position. And you'll, I'll show you later how I got these pictures. <laughs> this is, again, looking down from up on the building down to the street, and uh, you can see now, I don't know how clear it is to you, but they're the Channel 2 TV antennas. And right in this corner right here, those lines are our transmission lines that come up to the antenna. They were run on the surface of the, of the building, and they were mounted with stainless steel straps and using a Hilti gun into the steel. <coughs> And also along with that was electricity for the de-icers. Uh, we knew we had to put de-icers up there because when the Chrysler building was first built, the first winter that came along, it would be raining on the street but sleeting rain up at that altitude. And the rain coming onto the stainless steel in the night would freeze and put an ice coating over the stainless steel finial cover the whole building was all iced up and in the morning the sun would come up and go through the ice and hit the stainless steel and melt it from the inside out and what happened is that great big sheets of ice would slide off of this and right down to the street and what had happened is a piece of ice went down to the street and went through the roof of a taxi cab and uh, immediately said, boy, we, that's a real big liability. We can't have that. So what they did is they installed heaters below the finial in the top part of this building, massive heaters from steam heat from the basement. And when the temperature dropped, automatically the heaters would come on at about 40 degrees and blow hot air all the way up into the finial so as to keep it above freezing. So as freezing rain hit it, it would turn to water and run off. And that had a backup system as well, so that they didn't rely on one heater, they relied on two systems. So with that, we were told definitely that we can't create any ice. We have to be sure that our whole mounting uh, had a de-icer in it, 
so that we wouldn't drop icicles down onto the ground. And the riggers had to be very careful also. If they dropped a nut, it would be like a bullet hitting the ground. So you couldn't drop anything in the construction period either. And there was nowhere else for it to go but to skim off the building and most of the time go right to the ground. That's another shot of the same thing. Now this was taken. You can see this is the transmission line now coming into the side of the antenna. So this was taken from the opening that was made in the skin of the, uh, the finial. Didn't go outside, of course, to do that. Why did they run the cables up inside? Um, it uh, seemed to be more complicated to them to pull through all of the steel work, the steel work and what they had to do. <coughs> it was the riggers' decision to do it that way. We came up part of the way inside. When it got complicated, then poked to the outside to do it. And the riggers that I hired to do this were from Philadelphia. I had used them here in Philadelphia. And when I started pricing them out, riggers in New York very highly unionized and gave me quotes and prices that were two and three times more than what the Philadelphia riggers were going to charge. So putting them up in a hotel was a cheap answer to hiring them. Plus, I'd worked with them before. And they let you put a non-union rigor on them? Yeah, I got away with it. What? Just dumb kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't tell anybody, right? No, I didn't tell anybody. I just did it. <laughs> you know, and nobody ended up accepting it. It's another view of looking down at the street from the Chrysler building. Here you can see... This is looking up. You first see the Channel 2 antenna. So I'm doing this from what I think would be the 74th floor uh, going outside. Um, and you can't see very well, but there is one of the riggers that's up there with the antenna at this point. Another Did picture. they have to ch turn off Channel 2 when you guys were working on it? Channel 2 was dead. Transmitter was gone. Antennas were still there. The space was empty. Okay. They had moved to the Chrysler building mm -hmm. and took everything. I mean the Empire. Mm -hmm. That's looking at the antenna from down below. And to be able to observe what these riggers were doing and how they were putting the pieces together, uh, you can't just walk outside and look and see how you're putting it together. Are you putting the seals in right? Are you greasing them? Are you tightening the bolts right? Etc. Uh, so, and I couldn't go up to that opening uh, and look down while they were there. And again, it's, this time you can see this is a reflector for the horizontal antenna. You can barely see that. Yeah. Now here, this is me at the 74th floor where uh, CBS had, there was four doors that would open to the whole Newark area. And there was a dolly with a microwave dish. They'd push the dolly out on tracks and then be able to aim it to get a microwave signal back to the building. Well, they weren't using it now, but the tracks were still there and the the dollies were still there, and the iron, the rod, the iron tracks. So what I did is I opened the doors and used these tracks and pushed the rig out beyond the building, and then climbed out on it so that I could look with binoculars up at the antenna from that floor. There, I'm, that's me, and I'm using binoculars. And just below me is nothing but street. <laughs> but I was able to observe what was happening. Now, no safety belts or anything. You can see a little bit that what the rig is and the dish and the tracks. That whole thing comes back into the building and a sliding door closes the area. And you can see the street below. How many drinks did you have before? None. <laughs> How many drinks did you have afterwards? None. This is one of the riggers just hanging on. He was very daring, just saying hi. There were three of them, by the way, three guys. This was the transmitter room. Um, 
that was the, the cage that was built on the 74th floor. It's one of the riggers taking a nap on top of the power transformer. Uh, getting the transmitter up there, dumb kids don't research everything, you just go and do it. And um, this was a rust transmitter that was manufactured in Boston. RCA desperately tried to get the contract because it's a prime site that they wanted to be in. And Rust wanted the job as well. And they came in about $15,000 lower in cost, but were servicing it in a high manner. Anything I wanted, etc. RCA would just simply push in front of me a contract and sign it and take it or leave it kind of a thing. So uh, I ordered this, went up to Boston while it was being constructed. They put it on a truck to deliver it to the Chrysler building and the truck didn't have a power tailgate. It was They were expecting a loading dock and there are no loading docks of the Chrysler building. So here it is, the truck is on 43rd Street, the, the service side of the building. And what am I going to do with this great big heavy transmitter to get it off the truck and get it into the building? So I hailed some other truck drivers and asked if they wouldn't help out. A truck with a power tailgate backed up to the truck with, which had the transmitter on. I had four truck drivers at this point moving that onto the power tailgate and getting it to the ground and then got it into the freight elevator by decrating it and slipping it on an angle and it barely went in to where the gate could be closed. Didn't stand upright, it was too tall for the elevator. And took it up to the 73rd floor where they unloaded it from the 73rd because the other elevator goes from 73 to, from 63 to 73, I'm sorry. They went as far as 63. But that elevator was a passenger elevator and even smaller because it only had to service those 10 floors. So I said, now what am I going to do? I got it to the 63rd floor and I don't know what to do next. So um, the riggers were working there at the time and I called him and said, got any ideas? And he looked around at the fire tower which was fenced in. And he says, we can take the fences down to the fire tower on both floors and we'll put a rigging up on the 70, 72nd floor and hoist it and swing it out over the fire tower and hoist it up and then back in with the, the gate removed at the top. And that's how they got it up there. But <clears throat> seeing that transmitter dangle over 63 floors. <laughs> the statute of limitations has closed. Uh, did you consider any other manufacturers when you were... Only RCA. The boss wanted me to, to choose RCA because everything in the primary building was RCA. RCA transmitter, two RCA consoles, RCA mics, uh, and he was in love with RCA in spite of their lack of service and high price. What drew you to Rust? Um, Rust contacted me Bill because uh, they knew what I was doing in New York and uh, they wined and dined me, had shown me their plans and their construction, and working with ITA in Philadelphia, I learned a lot about transmitter construction and how not to build them and how to build them. And I was impressed with Rust, and um, they eventually got the contract to build it. It's very interesting you talked about the riggers and hauling it up, but I, I, I can recall yeah at WBC in Boston in the old Hancock building about the same time period, maybe a year later, doing the same thing to get a visual transmitter. My first and only visual I ever heard of or saw, but it worked pretty good once we finally hauled it up with enormous rigging arrangements and pictures of it swinging back and forth. The yeah. Enormous, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. They right. did tie some guidelines to it to try to keep it from swaying and hitting the walls. And it worked. They did a good job. But as a young kid, I didn't think of these problems. I just said, yeah, deliver it. <laughs> did Rust oh make God. the exciter and stereo generator? The, the, yes, the whole thing. Yeah, the monitoring. I didn't take pictures of the rack and the monitoring equipments in the front of the transmitter. I don't know why. 
just one of those things that uh, this is another look at the riggers and the antenna being constructed on the big ones are channel 2 TV this is the helicopter coming into the Pan Am building they at that time also were running lights along here to light it up at night and you can see a couple of the the bulbs on their cable. They've since removed, they removed them before we actually went on the air. We got our signal from the studio via microwave. So I had two microwave transmitters, one for the left and one for the right, and did one vertical polarization and one horizontal polarization and stacked them together. That was the vertical, this is the horizontal. And again, we mounted brackets. This is now at the 74th floor level because that's where the transmitter was. So this was just a matter of climbing out there and uh, putting the brackets on and then mounting the antennas. Did you have any trouble with icing on the corner reflectors? No. Huh. No. What was up above was all de-iced. Right. These were not de-iced. Two of the riggers hanging on the outside of that bracket, just looking up. The the young guy there, the the older guy, he's this guy is the experienced rigger. This guy was a rookie, and one day they had lunch. They came down for lunch. And they had lunch, and he says, "All right, got to go back to work." And the older guy started to climb up the rigging and the angle irons to get back out. To where they were working, and the younger guy started to follow him as his assistant and helper for what he was doing. But the older guy was maybe between 10 and 20 feet further ahead of him. And when he got to the opening, he climbed outside, and the bracket for mounting the antenna on the opposite side, he crawled around to that bracket and stood on it, out of sight. And when the young guy got up there, he looked up in the video. He says, he's not up there. And he looked down. He's not there. Where is he? He must have fallen. Where did he go? And the other guy is tweeting like a bird all around the other side. <laughs> they do those tricks all the time. <laughs> and and no, uh, no safety belt. He just walked around it. Crazy stuff. Made for interesting stories. There's the two microwave antennas and one of the guys out on the bracket because they had to be tuned and aimed and they did that, I didn't do it. He just stood out there on the bracket with a wrench in hand and being able to move it, to tune it while I watched the signal. The young guy didn't go out. He leaned out <laughs> but he was still able to do the job. There he is, just standing on the bracket, elbow against the tower. I don't think I would do that. Tom Day. Yeah. That's the younger guy. He did go outside. He did the work outside. This is now the, the finial again, where you can see the horizontal antenna and the vertical antennas. And this, this was the last point that there was any insulation or anything. Easy to climb above this point to get above the Channel 2 antennas. But climbing from here up was, for me, very difficult. For them, they, they managed to do it pretty well. You could feel a little vibration if the wind was up uh, of the... Uh, this is the um, Alfred design of how the antennas were fed. They put a tuning unit in so that they could divide how the power was going to be divided and the phases how it was fed to the two antennas. And this was done by Alfred and um, uh, I forget who installed it. I might have done that. This is showing the, what the VSWR was at our frequency. And it looks out pretty good. Great job that Alfred Antenna Company did. The young kid. This was the final pattern of the antenna. And you can see it 
to the proposed, and notice how it's rotated. So it's rotated to the right position to protect the stations that needed to be protected. That's Alfred's drawing because they um, submitted it for a patent, for the patent rights. <laughs>